So I promised to talk about cross addiction. When I say cross addiction, I mean people who develop an addiction to some other substance or a process either after they're in recovery or while they're dependent on another substance. Some of the most common cross addictions that we see, opiates like heroin or hydrocodone and alcohol. So not uncommon to see someone switch from one to the other. Another example, people who come into treatment who've had gastric bypass or other bariatric surgery that had no substance dependence prior to that surgery that are now in treatment for alcohol or drug dependence. It's very common for gambling and alcohol to go together. And then a substance I haven't talked very much about, tobacco and alcohol. So if you want to find your heavy drinkers or you want to find your smokers in a hospital setting, you only have to look for one of those. You find the heavy drinkers, you find the smokers. If you find the heavy smokers, your chances of finding the drinkers have just gone up significantly. Now, one way of looking at why is that is we talked about dopamine and serotonin and how these are neurotransmitters that uh, change with any addiction. So these substances or processes seem to increase dopamine and increase serotonin. And when you take them away, there seems to be this lack of dopamine and serotonin. But substances seem to also do other things. So, you know, opiates bind to these opiate receptors and mimic natural endorphins. And marijuana binds to these cannabinoid receptors and alcohol binds to all of the receptors, and things like Xanax and Valium bind to the GABA receptor. So if what determines whether someone de develops dependence on a substance is genetic, and there are lots of genes involved, if the disorder has to do more with dopamine and serotonin, you imagine that someone's risk for going from one to another to another dependency is much higher. Whereas if the genetic defect is primarily in the GABA receptor, well, then yes, they are likely to have issues around Xanax and maybe alcohol, but maybe much less likely to have issues around cocaine or some other substance that has nothing to do with the GABA receptor. So this helps to explain, first of all, you know, why is it that some people switch and some people don't. What it also explains is why we in treatment are so incredibly cautious about the use of prescription medications that have addiction potential. So someone might say to me, you know, they're addicted to cocaine. You know, why do you have this problem with me prescribing, you know, clonopin or Xanax? You know, one's a stimulant, one's a sedative. Well, my concern is that if the major problems have to do with the dopamine and serotonin, if the major problems have to do with this ability to measure reward and threat, then, you know, just because it was a stimulant doesn't mean they can't become dependent on a sedative, and vice versa. You know, patient is alcohol dependent, why can't I give them Concerta or Vyvanse for their ADD? Well, of course you can if you have a license to practice medicine, but the concern is that if you are activating the addiction pathways, if you're activating that, you know, instinctual part of the brain, that judgment part of the brain may or may not be able to overcome the impulses from the addiction part of the brain. So it's not 100%, but our use of medications with addictive potential in people with addictive disorders approaches zero because we don't have a way of measuring what that person's risk is of becoming dependent on that substance. So that's, that's the sort of bit about cross addiction and why this neurochemistry matters to cross addiction. And then back to the 
to like the genetic predisposition in regards to like the, the neurological effects. So are they, is it just a, a simple form of, gen, of genes that actually predispose somebody to be more addicted? It doesn't mm -hmm. really quite matter which, which substance it is? Is it just the same right. set of? So the question is, are there a set of genes then that, that, that create what used to be termed the addictive personality? Um, you know, I suppose that there is a biological way of saying, you know, because of your genetic makeup, you're much more likely to develop an addictive disorder, any disorder. Um, but it's, it's not so simple as we can say, oh, you need to have these four genes or what have you. It may be, let's say, and there are probably more than 20, but let's say that there are 20 and you happen to be born with 16 of the genes that have something to do with addiction, your chances of developing one or more addictive disorders is much greater than someone born with two. And that may then look like what we have called the addictive personality. But I think it's better to think of it as, you know, a brain more disposed than a personality issue. Um, and then the other, someone kind of wanted me, we talk so much about the rewards, to, to remind you that it isn't just reward that drives this system. It is fleeing from threat or fleeing from pain. And when we talk about salience, you know, part of it is the, oh, that's really good for me, but part of it is I don't really want to mess with the snake, or I don't really like being on the edge of the cliff, or um, uh, you know that um, some have said in motivational uh, interviewing that the issue has to do with pros and cons. And when someone is capable of listing more threats that are present because of their substance use than they have listed rewards their chances of changing go up dramatically. So it's a balance of threat and reward. Remembering that to the person, one of the threats is the threat of withdrawal. So that's a reason to continue to use for the person in the brain, is that threat of withdrawal. National quality form. Essentially what this says is that People who have an addiction to nicotine, alcohol, or opiates, all of which have FDA-approved medications for the treatment, should be on a medication. It's kind of like people who have a heart attack should be given an aspirin. Makes sense. You have an intervention. It changes you know, whether someone's likely to have a heart attack again. You have an intervention. It changes whether or not someone is likely to relapse. You ought to use it. There are a couple of caveats that are kind of interesting. Um, I mean, the first makes sense. If you have some medical reason why you shouldn't take a medication, well, obviously, we need to pay attention to that. It's kind of interesting, though, that the medication should always be delivered with psychosocial support. So this is a set of medications where we shouldn't just write the prescription. We ought to provide some kind of, of counseling. And, you know, we're, we're trying to get to that point where we understand, well, what kind of counseling in what setting, how much does it need to be, is five minutes enough, is 20 hours uh, enough? Um, and that uh, even in the case of nicotine, one of the things that has decreased our ability uh, to get people to quit smoking is that we provide them with the patch, or these days we provide them with Chantix, but if we didn't do anything along with it, then quit rates are really low. What's interesting is that even if uh, a physician writes on a prescription pad, stop smoking, and hands it to the person, that has an impact. So when the doc says, oh, I don't have time to deal with that, you're telling me you don't have time to write stop smoking on your prescription pad and hand it to someone? Come on. You know, I'm, I'm not buying that uh, personally. Notice that when it comes to opiates, like heroin, morphine, hydrocodone, we're talking about one receptor. When it comes to alcohol, which aside from nicotine is the most uh, common of the addictions, you've got all these receptors that alcohol is messing with. 
And that's one of the reasons why with a medication alone, alcohol dependence is so hard to treat because you have so many things that are being disrupted. So what are some of the medications available? With tobacco, you can replace the nicotine, and you can do that in lots of different ways, with a patch, with gum, with an inhaler. You can give them a medication known as bupropion, brand name, uh, Wellbutrin or Zyban, or you can give them a medication, Varencycline, brand name, Chantix. With alcohol, we have three medications that are FDA approved. We have disulfram, also known as antabuse. It makes you violently ill when you drink. But as my colleague and mentor said, you know, if being violently ill was all it took to make me stop drinking, I would have done it 28 years earlier. <laughs> um, and then you have naltrexone, and we'll talk about that. This is an opiate antagonist. What is it doing up there in that, you know, alcohol medications? And then a medication called a camprosate, also known as Camprol. So a 37-year-old professor came to outpatient detox, gave him some Librium, that's chlorodiazepoxide, it's a benzodiazepine, um, and uh, he didn't do really well on it. Well, he did. He did very well at drinking on it, and so now he comes to inpatient detoxification. He uses tobacco, no other drugs. He's had 18 months without alcohol in the past. He has a lot of anxiety, and his connection to AA is non-existent. Um, actually, I just admitted another professor uh, yesterday, and uh, it, I think it's the professor thing, you know. Um, I am way too smart for AA. Uh, we do our best to, um, to dissuade them of that position through experience, but it can be uh, really tough. Uh, for someone who believes themselves to be smart sometimes to relate to such a simple program. Um, so the first thing um, is he smokes. His chances of relapsing, if he's successful with um, stopping drinking, his chances of relapsing to alcohol are phenomenally larger if he continues to smoke. So at some point, we're going to talk about what are the ways that he could stop smoking because those behaviors are so linked. But we're also going to talk about what are some of the medications that we could use. In his case, I chose a camprosate or Campro. I talked about GABA which is the blanket, and glutamate, which makes people feel really bad. A camprosate theoretically helps to balance those things out so that maybe you get a little bit of your blanket back and that anxiety, insomnia, tremor, all that glutamate activity goes away better and sooner. One of the reasons why I chose a camprosate had to do with his underlying anxiety, and he didn't have an obsessive compulsive disorder, but he had some obsessive compulsive personality traits, and it's thought that obsessive compulsive disorder in part has to do with difficulties with the production and regulation of GABA. So given the choices, a camprosate seemed like a reasonable choice. Um, the most important thing to know from that slide is you get at least an extra 1 in 10 sober. And that's pretty important, especially if you're that one. Now, some may say, well, what about those other people who had to take it? Well, as long as they didn't have significant side effects, it's worth it to that one that got to be uh, sober. In terms of... Side effects, the most common side effects are all the gastrointestinal side effects and the fact that it's two pills three times a day or three pills twice a day. It's a lot of pills to take, and if you're not uh, used to pills, that can, you know, that can be tough. Um, one thing I would say is that this gentleman, who did very well, uh, actually, and did eventually develop some connection uh, to a 12-step uh, program, uh, found that in addition to helping with his urges to uh, 
uh, drink, this also did provide him a very mild anti-anxiety. And he felt like he was a little bit calmer and he was a little bit better able to focus. Maybe a result of the acamprosate, it may be because he stopped drinking, it may be both, I don't know. But for him, uh, this medication um, seemed to make a difference. 